Yeah, Gary, I know when you talk about recruitment, you say it shouldn't really happen that the manager you know, is, is doing that. I, I personally feel that you have to have that sort of happy medium where you have the manager and the director of football or someone from recruitment working together. Because what you've done with him is you've given him the exposure to get those players and they haven't been good enough. Obviously, you've got Anthony, 85 million. Um, the other players, I've got a list here. Um, you know, Mount Hoyland has, hasn't been as effective as you'd have liked. We go on and on and on as a goalkeeper. But surely, you know, he's, I, I, would, I think back to Alex Ferguson. When you were there, the most successful period Manchester United had Alex Ferguson had his fingerprints on pretty much every single signing that come. So that's where you had so much success. So if the manager doesn't bring in the right players, that proves that probably he's not the right man because you're giving him that trust. If he thinks Anthony's an £85 million player, that for me is such a worry. When I watch him play and what he brings to the team, that is terrifying that he thinks he's £85 million. Yeah, that, that's the one that's going to stand out, I think, just on Eric Ten Hag, that £85 million, £90 million on Anthony where... You know, he's obviously nowhere near that level. But even the 70-odd million pounds on Hoyland is a lot of money. 55 million on Mount's a lot of money. 60 million on Casemiro on a five-year deal is a lot of money. There are a lot of deals that you can start to look at with a glass half empty, you know, if you look at the recruitment. But, look, Jamie, I get your point around managers, but gone are the days, I think, where, you know, your dad and maybe Sir Alex Ferguson, they would have travelled probably three, four times, nights a week to go and watch other players, wouldn't they? And they yeah. would have been like a chief scout. They would have been head of academy. They would have been head of recruitment. You know, Sir Alex Ferguson used to go and watch games at night. He'd then go and watch the academy play in the sort of, you know, on the Saturday morning, then go to the first team in the afternoon. The head coaches that are here at these clubs now, they really do concentrate, maybe apart from, say, a Pep Guardiola and a Jurgen Klopp who've really sort of got their foundations set at a club. They come in for like a year, two years, thinking, right, I've got to get these players right. And the, the, the transient roles, really, head coaches at football clubs, to the point whereby they're concentrating solely on coaching the team. So the people who are going watching the players around the world, and this is a sort of global scouting game for Manchester United and the other top clubs in this country and in Europe, you know, those people have to be trusted to go and select the right players to bring forward to Eric Ten Hag. And then, obviously, then they liaise, converse with each other and they try and come to the right conclusion. What looks to have happened here is that Manchester United's yeah. recruitment department, we don't know what it is or who it is or how it's been built, but it's somewhere because they've got a lot of scouts employed, can't have gone and watched Anthony and signed him off at £85 million. It looks like they've allowed Eric Ten Hag to overrule them, which is... It's worrying because you need strength of leadership at the very top. Can you ever see that one working, Gary, with Anthony? It's a difficult one. I tried to sort of in the first half, do, you know, because the game was a bit slow, uh, do a little bit of coaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> where I was just trying to say to him, you know, he's got two things, hasn't he? He can cut back, he can take it down the line, he can cut back on his left foot and he can whip it in with his left foot as a cross, or he can cut inside, he can try and get a shot away. That was real, Matt Reed Mahrez's game for what would be five, five, six, seven years at Leicester and Manchester City. And he's nowhere near Riyad Mahrez. He's nowhere near the level. But if you're Very a young late. player and you're trying to get some consistency in your game, you're trying to look at a player that you might be like, I was trying to sort of just give him a little bit of something to say, you know, can you just look at another player and try and cut? He doesn't look to me like he's had any work on him, and that's maybe a sort of insult to the coaching staff at United. Because I know a couple of them. Steve, I work with Steve McLaren. I can't believe Steve McLaren's not speaking to Anthony and saying, look, just simplify your game back a little bit. You know, pop it back to your fullback, make a spin in behind. You know, when you get it and you sort of run at people, look to come in and then just try and drift it into an area at the back post where you might put a goal on the training pitch and you might ask him to do it 30 times. These consistent, this consistency and repetition that you used to see when you were developing young wingers, young wide players, where you know they're inconsistent. I, I do have my fears that the temperament is not there from Anthony, that the consistency is not there. But what I would say is he does, he has something in that he does take the ball every single time and he does want the ball every single time. And there are certain players out on that pitch that I don't feel they do. He actually wants the ball. Now, Ganacho, to be fair, wants the ball all the time. He thinks he can beat players. He's got the confidence. Anthony hasn't got the confidence at this moment in time to go and beat players, but he does show for it. But he's so frustrating. I mean, I blame the football club. I'd really do for bringing him in at 85 million pounds. It is not that boy's fault he's been brought in as one of the most expensive wide players in world football. He should never have been brought in for that money. But you've the got to back your to manager, his... Gary. You've got to back the manager. If, that, if your manager yeah. comes into Man United and he says, listen, I want this guy, get him for me. I need him, he's got the ability. And you don't then back him. What kind of message does that send between the manager and the ownership? I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. You've got to let him have his man. Yeah. If he says, he was my man at Ajax, I can get the best out of him. You've got no trust already before he even comes into the building. 
No, but a manager at a football club will want a lot of players. That's just the nature of managers. They do want players. And you, somehow, you sometimes have to say the magic word, which is no. And the magic word should have been said no to Ante, not based on the fact that you weren't supporting Eric Ten Hag, based on the fact that the actual quantum of money was too much. So same with Casemiro. If Casemiro comes in at £15 million pounds and he's on 100 grand a week on a three-year deal, of course you bring him in. On £60 million, a five-year deal at £20 million pounds a year, which costs £160 million, pounds, you don't bring him in. There has to be a no when it gets to that level of money. And with Eric Ten Hag, with Anthony, there was a report, I don't know if it's true or not, it was in the paper a couple of weeks ago, it was quite a detailed report that said that the scouts at Manchester United put a figure of around £25, £30 million pounds on Anthony. I would say if we were looking at a £25 million winger out there today, we would be looking at him completely differently. So I get the fact you've got to back your manager, but you have to say no to him. If that And what happened with Jamie, with, uh, with um, Anthony and with Casemiro, United got beat by Brighton. They then got beat 4-0 by Brentford, and there was an eight-day gap where there was all hell breaking loose with the ownership from the fans. There was massive crisis, there was massive pressure. United were playing on a Monday night football against Liverpool at home, and, and the theory was, and the thought was from everybody, that Liverpool were going to come and beat Manchester United at Old Trafford. So what do the Glazers do? They then pump up a load of money to try and get the fans on side. They've done it time and time again in the last sort of 10 years with different players, and they went and offered £60 million for Casemiro. Real Madrid couldn't believe their luck that they got offered £60 million for Casemiro. Casemiro couldn't believe he got offered the 400 odd grand a week that he's getting paid for five years. He couldn't, they couldn't believe it. And then Anthony, Ajax have already done their business that summer. They've sold Martinez to Manchester United for £60 million. So they always sell one player every summer, Ajax, to balance the books. That's the way they stay sustainable. And they couldn't believe that Manchester United came in at £85 million. And they went, what? £85 million? Pounds? We're going to have to sell him. And that's what happened. And United were in panic mode because they got beat 4-0 at Brentford and thought that they were going to get beat by Liverpool. And they had to beat Liverpool on the night. So, yeah, I get the fact you've got a backer manager, but where you've not got strong leadership, where you've not got a strong CEO, you've not got a strong sporting director, you know, that's where a manager then starts to sort of rule the roost. And because he got Champions League football, he had a good first season, he then gained power. And the people above him in the club didn't have the ability or skill or competence to say no to him on these two signings because they panicked and brought him in. Final thought then, Gary, and, and uh, you know, you've talked about Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Sir Dave Brailsford perhaps having a watching brief over the next six months. At any stage, if it gets worse than this for Manchester United, do you think the manager's position should come under scrutiny before the end of this season? I think, I think they'll leave the manager in place till the end of the season because I think they'll look at what's above it first and they will make a decision on the manager by the end of the season. There's no doubt about that because the reality of it is at the moment the performances are so poor. It's not the performances, actually. It's the fact that there's no pattern of play and that's the worry. Usually when you watch a team, you know, even Nuno in the very short time he's been at Nottingham Forest. I watched, I watched Nottingham Forest against Spurs a couple few weeks ago with Steve Cooper in charge and then obviously I've watched them against Newcastle on television a few days ago and I've watched them now today live. You can see already certain little things that are starting to occur that the manager wants. I'm really struggling this season with what Manchester United are trying to do. And I think that if that continues, if those four or five players come back, then Eric Ten Hag will find himself under real pressure. But I think they will hold off on that decision to the end of the season because I think they'll get a CEO in, a sporting director and a head of recruitment. They have got to, they're three gaping holes in the club. And then obviously then they have to look at the stadium as well because they do have to try and put a plan forward to the stadium because Manchester United do have to have pride in its stadium and where it plays.